Hey everyone, welcome back and let's write some more neat code today. So today let's solve the problem sum of subarray minimums. We're given an integer array and min b is basically defined as given some subarray like this one, we are going to go through every single possible subarray. Now, how many subarrays are there for an array of n elements? Well, it's going to be n squared. Basically, we have roughly n subarrays starting at every single element. So we could start here. Now, among every single subarray, for example, this one, we want to take the minimum element. What's minimum among all of these? It's one. So we take one. Now we're going to do that for every single subarray. So this is also a subarray, this is a subarray, this is a subarray, all of them. For each one, we're gonna take the minimum value in that subarray. And then among all of those, we're going to sum all of them up. And that is the result that we're gonna return. It might be a very large number, it could overflow. In that case, we want to mod it by this large prime number. Okay, so a brute force solution really isn't that bad for this problem. Just go over every single subarray. There are n squared subarrays. So that is what the overall time complexity is in a brute force approach. In this problem though, the brute force approach is not useless. It can actually help you come up with the more optimal solution, and that's not uncommon. So I wouldn't just gloss over the brute force solution. Let's actually look at it right now. Starting at three, what is the minimum element in this subarray? It's just three. Okay, now we have three, one. What's the minimum in this subarray? Well, we only have to look at the new element every single time and check, is it smaller than our previous minimum? In this case, it is. So now we get one is the minimum. Next, let's add two to our subarray. One is still the minimum. So once again, we would add one to our uh, result. And we would kind of keep doing this. Notice how if we have an element like one and it's the minimum element, it doesn't matter that we add a two or we add a four. These elements hardly matter at all. But if we were now to see an even smaller element, in this case, I guess that would only be zero, then this zero is the only thing we care about. Any number that came before really doesn't matter whether it was a three or a one or anything. Any subarray that we form now that is going to include this number, it's always going to be dominated by the zero. It's always going to be less than all of these guys. So that's an observation to make. Anytime we see an element that is smaller than anything we've seen before, we can pretty much disregard everything we've seen before. Okay, so how does that even help us though? Suppose we had an array that looks like this, four, three, two. I chose this because it is in strictly decreasing order. So here we see four is the minimum so far for this array. Next, we add a three. What's the minimum so far here? Well, it is three. Next, we add another element, two. What's the minimum so far? Of course, it's two. And like I said, when we see elements in decreasing order, or more specifically, when we see a new minimum element, everything that came before doesn't matter because these will never be added to the result ever again. Why would we add a four or a three to the result when we could add an even smaller element like two? So that's one. Now, if you've never heard of the monotonic stack or monotonic queue pattern, you might not be able to solve this problem. Now, I have heard of it, which is why like my intuition leads me to think that this is a monotonic queue problem. Even if you didn't know that, let me at least try to give you a small hint of how you might be able to figure that out. The idea is this. We talked about how when we find a new minimum, every other value will never be the minimum ever again. Why would we choose them when we can choose this? So there's sort of two extremes now. We each find a minimum like one, and then the elements are in increasing order. Why choose a two when we can choose a one? Why choose four when we can choose one? So in this case, we kind of keep a minimum. And again, everything before it doesn't matter. The other extreme is if we had something like four, three, two, in which case, first, this is the minimum, four, but then we find three, no longer the minimum. This is the minimum, then we find two, no longer the minimum. This is the nature of monotonic stack. Notice how the values are always in increasing order because if we have a four and we find a three, we remove the four. 
The values have to be in increasing order. And that matters because now we can kind of formulate this problem into sort of a sub problem for every single N for every single number. We are basically going to count how many times is that number going to be the minimum of a sub array. That's what we want to know. How many times is each number going to be contributed to the result? Now, using the idea of a monotonic stack, we can solve the problem. So here's the idea. We start at the first element. It's three. What we're going to do is push it to the stack. Now, the way I'm going to implement this, I'm actually going to push a pair of values. So I'm going to push the index and the number. So in this case, we're going to have one and three. Next, we're going to go to the next element. And actually, that should have been a zero. Sorry about that. The index of that it should have been a zero. Next, we get here. This is going to be a one one. We're going to push this to the stack. But before we push it to the stack, what we want to know is, is this element actually even smaller than some elements we've seen before? If that's the case, then what we're going to do is pop the previous element. So it's a three in this case, we would pop it from the stack here. So we'd remove it. The reason that we're doing that is because three is bigger than one. It will never be the smallest element in the array anymore. So based on that, we know that we can count basically all of the subarrays where this is the smallest element. I don't want to confuse you too much, so I'm not going to tell you exactly how we're going to do that calculation, but it's just a little bit of math. So assuming we were able to calculate that, like count how many subarrays included that, what we would do, let's say it's five subarrays where three is the smallest element. What do we do with that? We would say three times five is added to the result right? There's five subarrays where this is the smallest element. And we're told to basically add that smallest element to the result. So that's what we do here. And I'll talk about how I get that calculation in a bit. But now we would have pushed this onto the stack. So we get one, one. Next, we go to the next element. It is two at index two. So we just add it. It's an increasing order. This value is not smaller than the previous value. And once again, here four, we add uh, it's at index three value is four. We add it now. Our stack is non empty. We've gone through the entire input and this is the second phase of the algorithm. If the stack is non empty, we will iterate through it. So now it gets a bit more interesting because let's say we iterate through these three elements. These are the elements in our stack and they're actually a pair. So each one of these has like an index as well. And the index uh, might not just be a zero, one, two, like it might be kind of sporadic or sparse. So just keep that in mind. I had a bug with this. I was trying to use this index as if it were an index for each like individual element in the array. These could be non consecutive. They might not be monotonic. But now with an element, for example, this one, we want to count how many subarrays is this element the smallest. Since we know the stack is monotonically increasing, we know that every value to the right is going to be greater than or equal to one. And we can use that information because the way we actually count subarrays here is not trivial. You can't just say, okay, one, two, three. Okay, there's three subarrays. You actually can't just do that. That's what makes this hard. This is very challenging, in my opinion, for a medium problem. But let's take one here. That's one and two and three. So that's how many subarrays we can create by only using elements on the right side. What about on the left side? Well, when we were going to the right, we counted it like this, this and this. That's fine because we know every element to the right is going to be greater than or equal to one. What about elements on the left? Well, we don't necessarily know that, but there's a few things that we do know. Either the stack is like this, where nothing is before the current element that we're at. So either this is the first element in the stack. What does that mean? That means like by definition, every single element that ever came before must have been larger than this. So that's one. Basically, we know that if this is the first element in the uh, input. So that's great. Now, the other case is if we are at an element that's in the middle of the stack with this element, we can take this subarray 
because the element on the right is greater than two, but we can't actually go the other way. So we have two, but we can't do one, two because this element is smaller. We're trying to count subarrays that include two and two is the smallest. Okay. Now we kind of know the idea of taking elements on the right and taking elements on the left. Suppose we can create one, two subarrays on the right and just one subarray on the left. And yes, this middle one kind of counts. And the reason it counts is for the math. Suppose we got left is equal to one, like we kind of just did, right is equal to two. Then we just take these and multiply them to get the total number of subarrays where this is the minimum. If you're wondering why we multiply them, think about it this way. Suppose we can create an array like this, one, two, three, adding one element each time to the right side. We can also create a one, two, three, adding an element to the left on each side. So we can just take those three arrays and then those three arrays and create every possible combination, which is why we would take three times three and multiply them. So that will give us the number of subarrays. So I think that is enough intuition before we jump into the code. I will quickly say that the time complexity is going to be big O of n. We'll iterate over every element in here, potentially adding and popping it from the stack each time. That's going to be big O of n. Also big O of n for the space complexity needed by the stack. Now let's code it up. So the first thing I'm going to do is just get the mod. It's 10 to the power of 9 plus 7. I'm also going to declare the result. Initially, it's going to be 0. This is also what we're going to be returning at the end of the function. And lastly, let's declare the stack itself. And in my case, I'm going to have a pair of elements pushed to it. But if you really wanted to, you could just store the index because, of course, you can take the index and map it to every value in the array if you wanted to. So it's kind of redundant to store both, but I'm going to do it anyway. First phase, let's go through the input array. Now, ultimately, what we want to do is every element, every pair I n, the index value pair, should be appended to the stack. But before we do that, let's check. While n is less than the top of the stack, the top of the stack is at negative one, and we know we have a pair of values. We want to get the second value, the actual number. So we say index at one. So while this is true. And actually, it's possible the stack could be empty. We don't want an index out of bounds error. So let's check that stack and n is less than that. Okay, so that's part one. But if this is the case, what should we do? Well, mainly we want to pop from the stack. So let's just do that stack dot pop. Okay, that's good. But the hard part is going to be actually updating the result. So when we pop from the stack, let's grab what we popped. We popped uh, a pair jm. This is the index value pair from the top of the stack. So now we should be able to count how many subarrays included this as the smallest element. So let's count how many are going to be on the left side, and then let's count how many are going to be on the right side. The right side is actually easier. So just to make it clear, let's say we had these elements. Let's say that our J pointer is here and our I pointer is all the way over here. And just to make this technically correct, I'll make this a one. Suppose this condition is true right now n, the smallest value, 1, is less than the top of the stack, which is actually over here. Basically, we're calculating this distance. So calculating how many elements are on the right of j, which in this case is 3, or we could do i minus j. So that's how I'm going to do this, i minus j. And for how many elements are on the left of j? Well, remember that we just popped j right now. So for us to know the distance between this and the element that comes before that, we can kind of just pop again if we want to, but we don't want to augment the stack too much. So instead of popping, let's just get the top of the stack. So let's say J minus the top of the stack, negative one, and this time we want the index. So we get zero. So we can actually grab the index here. Again, this is going to be an index. And the most common bug you're going to have is getting your indexes mixed up. So the indexes that you're pushing to the stack and getting just by iterating over the loop or uh, other things, that's probably going to be, if you have any bugs, that's most likely where it's from. But now that we found this difference, we recognize that there's actually an edge case here. What if the stack is empty inside the loop after we've popped? What if it became empty? 
Well, that's why here we'll say if stack is non empty, else if the stack is empty, what should we do? Well, that means there was no smaller element than the element at index J. If there were, they would already be pushed to the stack. So what we can do here is assign this to J plus one. Suppose that J is one, it's at index one. How many elements come before that, including the number itself? Two. So that's why we do J plus one here. Okay, so this was a lot of intuition, but we have it down now. Lastly, to update the result, it's pretty easy. Just that same formula that we talked about, result plus m. Well, m is the value in this case, multiplied by left, multiplied by right. And uh, we want to take all this and mod it by the result. Now, finally, it is phase two of the algorithm where we're just going to iterate over everything in the stack and kind of just do what we did here. It's going to be very similar to this part of the code. It's almost the exact same. So here we're iterating over everything left in the stack. It should be in increasing order. Remember, I here is just the index of every entry in the stack. Now, if we want to get the entry in the stack, we can do this. We can say here's uh, an index number pair. Let's call it JN. And now what we're going to do is once again, count left and right. So here, what's left going to be? It's going to be J minus, and it's going to be slightly different than uh, this part of the code, because here we were actually pushing and popping from the stack. But here we're going to say stack at, and this part is the hardest part. So I'll kind of go over it slowly. What are we going to use for the index here? We want the pair that comes before the ith pair in this stack. We want the pair to the left of this pair. So we do I minus one. And from that pair, we want the index. So we say zero. Previously, we only did it if the stack was non-empty, but now we are going to do it only if I is greater than zero, because we want to make sure we don't get an index out of bounds error here. The else we can once again, just do J plus one. And for right, it's going to be pretty similar. We were doing I minus J. This time we don't have an I, but we know how many elements are to the right of this one. It's literally just the length of the array. That's the total number of elements in the input array. And we want to subtract everything from J and to the left of J. So we can say this minus J, however many elements came before and including J. So with that, we can say the result is now going to be equal to result plus N times left times right and modded all by this guy. So this is the entire code. It's not as easy as you might think. Well, it doesn't look super easy and it's not easy. Let's run it to make sure that it works. As you can see on the left, yes, it does. And it's pretty efficient. One thing I do want to clarify, this isn't easy to come up with, which is why I didn't mention it, but we can actually make this solution a little bit less code involved and it's relatively easy to do. I won't explain it in depth because I think it's the type of thing you'd probably understand or appreciate more if you kind of thought about it for yourself. But basically, we're going to take the input array and actually augment it just a little bit. So we're going to take array and set it equal to itself and append an element to it and add an element to the beginning as well. So here we're going to add negative one and the value itself is going to be negative infinity. We're also going to add an element to the end and it's going to be length of the array. Well, that's the index and the value is going to be negative infinity as well. Okay, I don't know why I had a tuples when we know the input array is actually just an array of numbers. Uh, so I uh, updated this, but I went ahead and ran this. And as you can see on the left, it does work as well. Can you answer in the comments why that is? If you found this helpful, please like and subscribe. If you're preparing for coding interviews, check out neatcode.io. Thanks for watching and I'll see you soon.